turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to continue our new series on the book of Colossians. And let's read Colossians 1 verses 15 through 22 where we especially see the, the preeminence, majesty of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the cross. And you once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And I know it stops in the middle of the sentence, but we will give some extra attention to the next section the next week. Let us pray. Father, we are grateful that we serve a glorified Christ, majestic, preeminent, when he through all things were created. We thank you that we can trust you uh, in the midst of whatever is going on in our lives, thinking of your sovereignty and majesty and all this glory that we just read about. Pray that you would raise our minds, our vision, to see more fully uh, the glory of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, when Charles Spurgeon became the pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, the first words he spoke from the pulpit were these. He said, I would propose that the subject of, this, of the ministry of this house, as long as this platform shall stand, and as long as this house shall be frequented by worshipers, shall be the person of Jesus Christ. I'm never ashamed of thou myself a Calvinist. I do not hesitate to take the name of Baptist. But if I am asked what is my creed, I reply it is Jesus Christ. My venerated uh, predecessor, Dr. Gill, has left the theological heritage admirable and excellent in its way, but the legacy to which I would pin and bind myself rather, God helping me, is Jesus Christ, who is the arm and substance of the gospel, who is in himself all theology, the incarnation of every precious truth. Well, this morning we are continuing our sermon series on, on Colossians. And we're looking at a passage that sets forth really the preeminence, the glory of Christ. This section in Colossians 1 proclaims that Christ is preeminent in creation and preeminent in his work of atonement, now, particularly in this passage mentioning reconciliation. And this was an important message to the Colossians who were being influenced by perhaps a blend of pagan and Jewish teachers who claimed a higher mystical knowledge, venerated angels, and so forth. Uh, Paul proclaims that Christ is preeminent over every created thing, including angels, and is the only way of salvation. Uh, in Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20, we just read, it speaks about him uh, being over all things, a creator, it really forms a unit. In fact, certain ideas about Christ are presented in relation to creation that are parallel to in the same sequence when Christ is considered as the Redeemer. And notice in verse 15, uh, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And in verse 18, and he is the head of the body of the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. 
that in everything he might be preeminent. Verse 16 mentions, for in him all things were created. In verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In verse 16, it does mention both in heaven and on the earth. And in verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. So there's some parallels or symmetry throughout the passage. And not only do the same expressions occur in both sections, but they occur in the same sequence. Uh, there is an idea and form parallelism. The glory of Christ in creation is balanced by his majesty in redemption. Douglas Moo also points out that these same ideas are picked up throughout the rest of the letter. For example, verse 16 mentions he's the head of, um, mentions for in him all things were created in the heavens and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And in chapter 2, the end of verse uh, 10, you have a similar phraseology. It says, and you have been filled with him who is the head of all rule and authority. And there are similar parallels between chapter 1 and chapter 2. Uh, 118 paralleled in 219, 119 to 29, and 120 to 215. Well, our rescue from the domain of darkness that he mentions in verse 13, we looked at last week, is certain and lasting because God accomplished it through none other than the one who is the Lord of the universe. As we build into our lives really a clear understanding of the glory and majesty of Christ, I think we're moved toward worship, gratitude, and an understanding that our every spiritual need is truly met through Jesus. First we see that Christ is preeminent over creation. Christ's deity is affirmed in his personhood throughout this section. In Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Uh, in 2.9, it mentions that for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Uh, the first phrase in this verse in chapter 1 is similar to Hebrews uh, chapter 1. In verse 3, where there's that whole section of things being spoken about Jesus. Hebrews 1.3, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. goes on to speak, after making purification through sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Both of these statements, they're similar, both affirming uh, that Jesus is God. Uh, the term glory of God and the image of the invisible God are phrases that, of course, strongly affirm His deity. In Colossians 2 verse 3, had the similar idea, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And of course in verse 9, the whole fullness of deity dwells in Him bodily. Uh, we have in 115 also the statement, that Christ is the firstborn of all creation. In the fourth century, Arius uh, used this statement to argue that Jesus was a created being. These and some others. And today, Jehovah the Witnesses have used the same phrase to teach that Christ is a created being, uh, the first being that was created. And sadly, in a recent Ligonier Ministry State of Theology survey, 65% of evangelicals agreed with the statement, Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. And a sad statement that 65% would, would, hold, would agree with that statement shows that very little is being taught. Of course, that's not what the phrase means. The first part of the verse has already mentioned that Christ is the image of the invisible God. He's not a mere creature. The idea of being the firstborn means that Christ is the one to whom belongs the right and dignity of the firstborn in relation to every creature. God the Son is eternal and highly exalted above every creature. 
In fact, Psalm 89, a Messianic psalm, particularly coupled with the Davidic covenant, addresses this idea in verse 27 of that psalm, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And if you look back at that psalm with me, Psalm 89, in verse 29, I will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heavens. Well, it speaks of the Davidic covenant in this uh, psalm. Uh, here is an eternal throne being mentioned, which ultimately comes from David's son, uh, the eternal son of God. And then in verse 37, uh, speaking of, well, 36 and 37, His offspring shall endure forever, His throne as long as the sun before me. Like the moon it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. And uh, Paul has just been describing in Colossians uh, Christ in messianic kingly terms, verses 12 to 14. And now here is a reference really to a uh, a psalm speaking in those same terms. Now we could think about David's dynasty in the Old Testament. It did last a long time, around 400 years, which was really a very long time for ancient kings, but it didn't last forever. There came a time when the monarchy in Israel ended uh, with the Babylonian invasion. They had some governors, rulers, that were in the line of David after that, like Zerubbabel at the time of Zechariah. Uh, but never that monarch reigning like that again. Ultimately, those promises are fulfilled in Christ. Now, I think this is interpretation is confirmed in verses 16 and 17 of Colossians 1, when Christ is the creator and the one who upholds all things. For by him all things were created in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. A uh, similar statement was made in John 1, uh, 1 to 3 passage, read earlier, and of course in the Hebrews 1 passage. Therefore he has existence before all things, he is the creator. Christ's deity is also affirmed by his works of creation. As we just read, all things were created for him and by, by him and for him. He is the agent of creation. It is through the eternal Son of God that creation comes into existence by him and for him. Christ is both the agent and the goal of creation. All creation without existence owes its existence to him. Without exception, owes its existence to him. And of course, it must serve the purpose ultimately of bringing glory to him. And you can think about the attributes <clears throat> that are ascribed to Christ in this statement. As creator, he has the power of being, he is omnipotent, and he is eternal. Uh, very similar to 1 Timothy 1.17, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. All these statements are true of Christ as God, as God the Son. Second, He is over all created beings, including angels. Uh, 1.16, For by Him all things were created in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers of authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Of course, this would include uh, angels as well. Uh, this is particularly an important thought for the Colossians, since some of the teaching they were receiving exalted and venerated angels. Uh, Christ is sovereign and Lord over all of his creatures. Uh, there's no reason for trusting in, seeking help from, or praying to, or worshiping any created being, whether an angel or a godly person, has already died. Uh, this speaks against the practice of praying to the so-called saints uh, in, in heaven, as described in Roman Catholic theology. This also speaks against the veneration uh, of angels. Uh, the exaltation of the angels has become common in our culture. 
few years ago, I remember being in a copy shop and a lady asked me, do you believe in angels? I said, well, yes, I, they exist because the Bible speaks of them. And she said, well, I know my angel. <laughs> kind of, huh? <laughs> and uh, she said, oh, yeah, he talks to me in my dreams. And she said, his name is Joe. And, uh, and uh, she had no interest in hearing about, about Jesus. She just wanted to talk about her angel. <laughs> And uh, kind of sad and pitiful. And you might remember in the Bible the angels never received worship. And in fact, uh, in Revelation 4, 8, 19, 10, remember they reject all worship except to God. And in fact, in 19, Revelation 19, 10, remember John is kind of overwhelmed by the glory of the things he's seen. And he starts to bow down to the angel and he's corrected, don't do that. Uh, William Hendrickson writes concerning angels that they, quote, are mere creatures and have them been created through and for Christ, are subject to Him. The inference, of course, is this. Also sal for salvation, you should expect everything from Him and from Him alone and not from Him and the angels. Third, we see Christ upholds all things. Verse 17, and He is before all things. And in Him all things hold together. It's also stated in Hebrews 1.3. Here again the power of being, the power of existence is ascribed to Christ. Nothing exists nor continues to exist apart from the sustaining work of Christ. This affirms not only His deity, His sovereignty, and His preeminence over all things, but of course as Creator He is God. We've been considering this in terms of creation itself, but think about it in terms of our salvation. <clears throat> Remember how Jesus was taunted and ridiculed? He was blindfolded during the times of his trials, and they struck him. Tell us who hit you. Prophesy to us. On the cross, come down from the cross. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Or one of the thieves, save yourself and save us also. While all that was going on, he upheld their very existence. And Charles Spurgeon, in a sermon on the cross, made a point that uh, his work on the cross was a great example of restraint as well as his love. And uh, the very essence of his tormentors was sustained by the word of his power. Uh, he could have simply will it and they would face God's judgment. Willed it. Christ's work of redemption demonstrates this tremendous restraint in order to carry out a plan of redemption. And of course in Hebrews chapter 1 again we see him directly called God. It's one of the Eight places in the New Testament where Jesus directly called Theos, God. In 1 8 through 14, notice how this passage captures much of the same ideas we had just discussed. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe you will roll them up. Like a garment they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has the other said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? In verses 10 through 12, or a quote from Psalm 102, and that particular psalm is speaking about the Lord, Yahweh, all the way through. Here it is ascribed to the Son. It's one of those passages where the Lord in the Old Testament, Yahweh in the Old Testament, is ascribed directly to uh, God the Son, or Jesus in the New Testament. Um, Christ is directly called God. He is the agent of creation. 
He is immutable. He will fold up creation like a garment. He's exalted over the angels. A friend of Teddy Roosevelt reported that when he and Roosevelt used, used to play a little game together, when they were visiting with each other at, after the evening's conversation or meal, they would go outside on a clear night and search the skies until they found a faint speck of the light, the light mist in a certain spot in the heavens. Then one or the other would recite, that's the spiral galaxy of Andromeda. Uh, that speck is as large as our Milky Way. It's one of the 100 million galaxies, or you know, of course now we think of more. It consists of 100 billion suns, many of them larger than our sun. Then Roosevelt would grin and say, now I think we're small enough, let's go to bed. <laughs> and, uh, but you can consider the, the created universe and the, the macro universe to the micro universe and see the complexity there. And remember that Christ is the creator and sustainer of all things. And when you're going through trials or times of suffering, remember the wisdom and power of God that's being mentioned in these passages, just this passage alone. If you're redeemed, you're the object of God's special care and love. And you know that God is infinitely wise, and even when you don't understand what's going on, there is purpose and meaning to your suffering or trial or frustration. And you think of having that perspective firmly planted in your thinking, and then it will give you comfort and hope. I might mention the time that you need to have that planted firmly in your thinking is before you're going through some of those things. I've uh, mentioned before when my brother was killed in 1990, I had just at that time been doing a study of the book of Job and was reading Job 14 verses 3 and 4 that talked about our days are determined and uh, we're not add one to it or pass one away or you know, pass, go past that number. And uh, got news of my brother's death, I was immediately that verse came to mind and and while you have grief over those things, and so do my parents, at the same time, you remember that God has a plan that is, is, is perfect. And, um, and working out that. There's a, a statement made by a 19th century commentator that uh, I thought was very meaningful on this. He said, if I was omnipotent like God, there are many things that I would change in my life. But if I was omniscient like God, I wouldn't change anything. Well, Jonathan Edwards, in commenting on this, said, How great a happiness must it be to be the object of love of Him who is the creator of the world and by whom all things consist, and is exalted at God's right hand and made head over principalities and powers in heavenly places, who has all things put under His feet and is King of kings and Lord of lords, and is the brightness of the Father's glory. Surely to be beloved by Him is enough to satisfy the soul of a worm of dust. We also see Christ as preeminent in redemption. We could spend a lot more than one sermon on the things in this text. But verses 18 through 22, and He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of this cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in the body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him. Well, this passage particularly speaks of Christ's work of reconciliation. Uh, it also addresses His work of salvation kind of in a general sense. First we see it mentioned that He is the head of the body. In Paul's epistles here and in Ephesians, are the first times the idea of Christ being the head of the body, the church, appears. And while Paul had used the body analogy in 1 Corinthians concerning different members having different gifts, 
He did not specifically state that Christ was the head of the body. At Colossae, this headship or preeminence of Christ was distinctly the truth that needed to be emphasized. As head of the body, Christ causes his church to grow. Uh, Christ is the ruling head of the church, and if Christ is the head of the church, then the church is no, in no sense dependent upon any creature or angel. In fact, it receives its growth, its guidance from Christ through the Holy Spirit. Time of the Scottish Reformation, the Scottish Covenanters uh, were particularly offended by the uh, English idea that the king was head of the church. Uh, the way the Reformation had taken place in England initially made Henry VIII uh, the, the head of the church, a uh, great shining star of morality. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, and that continues on, continued on. Well, uh, in the conflicts between Scotland and England, the English forces are demanding that the Scottish Covenanters would uh, submit to the king as head of the church. And their argument was only Christ is head of the church, and we're not going to exchange one pope for another one. And uh, we're not going to exchange an earthly monarch to be head of the church of Christ. We're going to preserve the crown rights of Jesus. And they were right. We also see Christ being the firstborn from the dead in verse 18. Christ's resurrection, among other things, proclaims his accomplished work of redemption. It is the foundation of our Christian growth and victory over sin. It's an assurance of our future resurrection. Sadly, Thomas Jefferson could not accept the miraculous elements in Scripture. And he edited his own special version of the Bible in which all references to the supernatural were deleted or edited out. And in editing the Gospels, he confined himself solely to the moral teachings of Jesus, which he liked. And the closing words of Jefferson's Bible are, they lay, there they laid Jesus in, in the tomb and rolled a great stone at the mouth of the sepulcher and departed. Well, thank God that's not the way the story really ends. We see Christ accomplished a work of reconciliation. First, verse 20 mentions a reconciliation of all creation. It says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of this cross. Um, some liberal theologians have used this passage to argue for universalism. Everyone saved in the end. The idea that Christ reconciled everything, and so everyone saved. Of course, not only does this passage speak specifically of you who had been redeemed, but many passages speak about an ultimate separation or division in mankind. Matthew 25 speaks of the division between the sheep and the goats, uh, the saved and the lost. Douglas Moo makes a very good comment on this passage. He said, the language picks up the widespread Old Testament prediction that in the last day God would establish universal shalom, peace, or well-being. And there are many passages in the Old Testament that speak of that. In fact, I mentioned Douglas Moo. I highly recommend his commentary. It's my favorite one on the book of Colossians. But part of the Christ's work was to redeem the creation itself and the corruption of sin and provide for restored heaven and earth. Sin, of course, ruined this created world. Uh, Christ's work brings restoration. Uh, there's a great, almost, you could say, commentary on this in Romans chapter 8, in which Paul is talking about that type of redemption or restoration. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 18. Speaking of our future glory that's coming, and speaking of creation as well. Creation personified, longing for that day of, the, of restoration. Romans 8, starting at verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing or revelation of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, 
not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage of corruption and attain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Though we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Of course, we are, as John mentions, we are now in 1 John 3, we are now adopted into God's family, but it doesn't yet appear what we will be. And of course, that full manifestation comes in the future. And of course, here's creation being redeemed. Ultimately, the new heavens and new earth. We had that complete restoration. Uh, Caution speaks of this work as an established way, a typical way of Paul stating something. Romans brings out the already and not yet aspect to it. And the ultimate fulfillment of all this, Christ will one day be all in all, as 1 Corinthians 15, 28 mentions. Second, notice this work occurs on the cross. The complete work of redemption, redemption, reconciliation, sacrifice, propitiation, all those things took place on the cross. Um, Christ did not go to hell and pay for our sins there, as some of the Word of Faith teachers have taught. Uh, Certainly the Bible does not hold to that idea. In fact, remember Jesus' last words on the cross, it is finished, it's accomplished, debt's been paid. Uh, the work of salvation was complete. Uh, Christ's work of reconciliation removes the barriers that would separate a holy God from embracing us. Which, of course, we see in verses 21 and following, and you who are once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in the body of this flesh by his death in order, present, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. The same sermon Jonathan Edwards preached, if we are in Christ, justice and the law had their course with respect to our sins without our hurt. The foundation of the sinner's fear and distress is the justice and the law of God. They are against him and they are unalterable. They must have their course. Every jot and tittle of the wall must be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall be destroyed rather than justice should not take place. There is no possibility of sins escaping justice. But yet if the distressed trembling soul who is afraid of justice would fly to Christ, he would be a safe hiding place. Justice and the threatening of the wall will have their course fully while he is safe and untouched, as if he were eternally damned. Christ bears the stroke of justice, and the curse of the law falls fully on him. Christ bears all that vengeance that belongs to the sin that has been committed to, to him, and there is committed by him, and there is no need of its being borne twice over. His temporal sufferings, by reason of the infinite dignity of this person, are fully equivalent to the eternal sufferings of the mere creature. And then his sufferings answer for him who flees to him, as well as if they were his own, for indeed they are his own, by virtue of his union between Christ and him. Strong statement. Of course, in Romans 8, 1, we have the great statement, there is now no, therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you ever struggle with guilt? Do you ever feel separated from God because of your continued struggles in sin? Are you aware of your daily struggles and feel perhaps God's not there? And there are some things in people's Christian lives that they struggle with all their lives. Some days of victory, some days of struggle and failure. If you're truly in Christ, He is, as Edward said, your hiding place. Charles Spurgeon, speaking of his conversion, said, I thought I could have leaped from earth to heaven at one spring when I first saw my sins drown in the Redeemer's blood. John Newton, you know, the slave trader who was converted to Christ. In fact, spent much of his life in ministry as well, fighting the slave trade in England. When he was 82 and near death, said, My memory is weak, 
But I remember two things. I am a great sinner, but Christ is a greater Savior. If you believe in Jesus, all this is true of you. Yes, we are all great sinners, but Christ is the greater Savior. The one who is sovereign over all the universe is also the one who died and rose for your salvation. God has moved heaven and earth to redeem you. And if you're in Christ, you can rest in that truth and reality. If you're not in Jesus, turn to him now. Trust in his perfect work of atonement. Because outside of Christ, there is no hope. You are still in your sins, and you will face the judgment of God apart from Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the, your sending the Son. Jesus, we are grateful for your accomplishment of this work and Holy Spirit for your work of applying it to us, opening our hearts, bringing us to salvation. We are also grateful for ongoing work in our lives of bringing change, often very gradual, sometimes imperceptible at the moment. But we are grateful for that you are always at work in our lives, O oh God. We pray that you would help us to trust you, even in the realm of, of forgiveness and those areas where we constantly struggle. Help us to trust you in terms of providence, the things in our lives, especially those things we don't understand. And that in our lives we would not only trust you, but give all glory to you. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.